Michael Fairbrother, the founder of Moonlight Meadery, joins me to talk about making braggots. This is Beer Thins Podcast number 138. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 138, and it's early December 2016. Michael Fairbrother from Moonlight Meadery joins me to talk about how to make a great braggot. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now, only $19.99 for a year-long magazine subscription, or $17.99 for their digital edition. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and for beer lovers. And you can read my new column called Ask the Experts there. Take advantage of their special deal now at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the world-class line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. John Blickman has his first ever holiday giveaway where you can win a complete brew easy system, quick carb instant carburetor, Hellfire burner, or brew vision controller. You can enter for free now by clicking on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, my Beersmith software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers that lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Michael Fairbrother, owner and founder of Moonlight Meadery. Michael is a nationally award-winning mead maker who started his own meadery in his garage in 2010 and now runs one of the largest meaderies in the Northeast. You can find out more about his meads at MoonlightMeadery.com. Michael, it is uh, fantastic to have you back on the show. Thanks, Brad. Pleasure to be back. So how are you doing? I think it's been uh, a little over a year since since we had you on the show, although I get to see you at HomebrewCon every year, which is great. (laughs) Yeah, that's a lot of fun. So it's it's been a really busy year for us. Um, we've uh, branched out. Um, we've uh, now starting to make ciders. Our ciders are now available uh, by can. Last year, to kind of give your uh, listeners a little perspective, we sold about twelve thousand gallons of cider, uh, mostly on draft. Uh, in the last th- three weeks that we've started canning cider, um, we sold six thousand gallons already. So um, cider market for us has taken off really fast. Uh, we're getting into making braggots. Uh, you'll see our line of braggots under the name Hidden Moon Brewing Company uh, coming into the market in early February time frame. That is awesome. I'm, uh, well, we're going to talk about braggots today. And I want to let you know, Michael, I have my very first cider it is in the fermenter right now and bubbling away. So a b- cool. big milestone for me. What was your uh, starting gravity on that? Oh, it was actually pretty low. I think it was like 1048 or 1050. Nice. But uh, yeah, we, uh, I was trying to make we, something refle- you know, light and refreshing kind of thing. We make a 13.5% cider mm. uh, called How Do You Like Them Apples? And um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's that's a, a little New heavier England, than mine. Yeah, it's a New England style cider. And um, I was reading the BJCP style guidelines a few years back in the 2000 not the latest edition, the previous version didn't have any commercial mead or cider makers making a uh, New England style hard cider. So I, I thought I could rectify that. Well, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to, uh, to trying some of that. Um, cool. Today, though, we we're going to talk about Braggot. And uh, uh, I got to sample a couple of your Braggots uh, at the last two homebrew cons. And, you know, they were really fantastic. Uh, you, you made a really deep, dark uh, Braggot that still had a lot of honey flavor in it. Um, why don't we start by talking about what braggot is? I think many people may not even be familiar with it. So a braggot is a um, old style of beer that is basically made with a majority of the fermentables coming from a honey. Now, commercially, is a lot different than amateur style uh, um, braggots. Most of the amateurs using a primarily... Um, uh, the fermentables come from honey. Most commercial um, brewers are using between 10 and 20 percent of the fermentables coming from honey. And and I assume you're using more. I'm just guessing here. Uh, we're going for about 20 percent. <laughs> um, well, Braggot also has uh, some pretty deep historical roots. Uh, what's the history of the style? So, so it, it basically, you know, they they were you know trying to get um, rich flavors and and characteristics so it's an old style um not a lot of uh, breweries have made it 
Um, there are several of the bigger breweries that have made some over the years. Um, but it, it can be, you know, I've done like sour braggots, uh, the Russian Imperial um, Stout that most of the uh, homebrewers might have tried my um, braggot at the National Homebrewers Conference. It took me seven years to make that. So it's it's something that you can't really rush out the door really quickly. Um, but I have done some collaborations all over the company, or company country. Um, next week, I'm doing another one with uh, Smog City in um, L.A. I've done um, collaborations with Urban Chestnut, uh, Heretic Brewing Company, um, Stone Brewing Company. I did done a few down in Australia. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a growing craft beverage and it's a different flavor and you can achieve different things from the base, um, that you would like. So you really kind of pick a base style and then work towards modifying that style to, to accompany the honey and give it some rich depth and characteristics. Now, can you use any style really of beer to, to, to start it as a base or, or do you have some styles definitely work better? I tend to think of um, like stouts, box, uh, brown ales. Um, we've done a Berliner Weiss uh, that really came out fantastic. The guys at Jonathan Wakefield Brewing Company um, down in Miami and I did one. And um, I love the way that flavor came through. You know, I've done a milk and honey stout with stone. A couple, I like Russian Imperial. So you're going to see the first one coming out of doors from us being a Russian Imperial. Um, but we have, we've got a, you know, we're going to do a kettle soured um, style um, later on as we get down the pipeline. Heretic and I, we've done a IPA that was, a, I think, oh, you can't see it, but way up here in the background. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's the yeah, yeah. Heretic uh, collaboration um, uh, that we did, which was called Evil Bee. Um, really kind of liking the play with that. But what we're going to do with uh, Hidden Moon is try to skip the naming and coming up with names and just go with the styles uh, so we can really kind of be clear to the um, to the potential beer drinker that this is the base style so that they get a good reference mine. Now, the last couple of years, I think you served the Russian Imperial Stout, right? Is that right? Yes. I, I literally brought every drop that I ever made of that to the National Homebrewers Conference. <laughs> it was fantastic, by the way. There's a long line for that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I do get a good chuckle when I see uh, the brewers packing up at the end of the night, and they go, "How come you always have the biggest lines?" And I say, "Well, I make some of the best beer and mead." It's really good. Um, I understand the style was lost for for almost a hundred years. I think nobody brewed it commercially for a long time, right? That that's my understanding. Yeah. And um, I understand also that there are some interesting regulations here in the U.S. Uh, regarding who can make braggots and who can't, right? Well, one would think the easiest way to, to allow a braggot to be made would be to allow a meadery make um, its mead, have a brewery make its beer, and then post-fermentation allow us to blend them together to get a beverage that we would, would like. And wouldn't that sell. be great, right? That would be fantastic. However, the United States laws don't allow that to happen. So I could actually take my mead, export it to, say, Canada, blend it with a, a brewery up in Canada, and import that back under the current licensing I have and sell that legally in the United States as a beer. Now, that's fine. <laughs> you just can't do it here in the United States, which is so, crazy. So, uh, so I mean, what, what does it take to actually brew uh, Ragged here in the United States as a, as a commercial brewer? You need to be a brewer, so you can't do it under a winery license. So, you know, some of the breweries, um, or like Rabbit's Foot, for example, Mike Fall has both a brewing operation and a winery operation, and he alternates his premise between the two prop or two licenses. So the TTB allows you to declare a space a brewery, and then send him a letter and declare the space a winery, and send him a letter and declare the space back to being a brewery. And you can have common spaces between the two but a winery is not allowed to have malt on the property or on the premise so you can define your premises where you keep your malt it's a lot of red so, tape it sounds now, like, I, so i mean you essentially have to have both licenses though right that's one way to accomplish it um i've chosen a different path um, what we've done is we've went and got a hold of our federal wholesaler permit so that i can actually contract brew um, have somebody contract my – brew my recipes, so gypsy brew for me, um, and then I buy that back from them and sell it to my wholesalers. 
So essentially the name Hidden Moon Brewing Company is our DBA for Moonlight Meadery. So if we can't put the name Meadery onto a beer label, we have to have a DBA name for that. <laughs> and we can license that name to a brewery, brew my recipe. I buy it back. We sell it to our wholesalers. And then Moonlight Meadery, DBA, Hidden Moon Brewing Company has a beer in the market. And we're going to give that a shot for a few years till we see if we really want to um, invest all that capital into buying the equipment for the brewing uh, side of the operation. But if the fan base for my meads and ciders find that I have a beer and they like that just as well, I'm pretty sure we're going to have some uh, some growth in our future. So, so is then a braggot considered a beer or a wine when it's finished? <laughs> that depends on each state. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, it's considered a beer. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so here in New Hampshire, if I make it under 12% alcohol, I can make that. And, and and so here's another funny thing for the system. So federally, I have a winery license. I have a federal wholesaler permit. Here in New Hampshire, I have a beverage manufacturing uh, permit and a winery permit. Beverage manufacturing is um, the brewery side of the operation. So again, to be able to have it at my tasting room and be able to sell it here in New Hampshire, I have to have that license. Otherwise, I'd have to sell it to a distributor and have them distribute it here in New Hampshire, even though for the winery side of my business, I have to self-distribute in New Hampshire. There is no option. That's just to sell it in your own tasting room, huh? Right. It's lovely. It's it's a $100 a month fee. And the other interesting... um, thing that I discovered in this process so that we make cider that I've talked about. The cider that is sold by Moonlight Meadery is taxed in the state of New Hampshire at 5% of sales. So I pay $1.82 a uh, case to the state. Sorry, $2. Details don't matter. $2 per case. It's fine. If I make it under the DBA, so a DBA is a synonym to the name, it's uh, 68 cents a case in taxes. I love so, it. So you need a good lawyer basically to make braggot is what you're telling me. Well, or cider. braggots are ciders and it's just, um, the way laws are written. So, you know, you, you talk to people all over the country, you know, commercially, you know, it's different rules apply to different beverages. And, you know, my stance on it is that a fermented beverage, whether it's cider, beer, wine, should all be taxed at the same rates. You know, there shouldn't be different classifications or different types. If there's a distilled spirit, you know, sure, you can have a different tax rate on that based on the alcohol content, but there's no valid justification for taxing the same product made by the same company two different ways, depending on which side of the license you think what made the product. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to dive uh, any farther down that rabbit hole. But, sure, uh, sorry. <laughs> but it is, no, it's okay. It's interesting, but it's just, it gets so complicated. And as you point out, most of the alcohol laws in the United States are all, you know, all state by state. Um, so the question I had for you next, um, you get into you get into making braggots, right, for commercial sale. Is it is it okay to make a braggot at home, though, right? Sure. Um, so any... Any um, home brewer can legally make uh, as long as there's two living uh, or two um, adults over 21 in the household up to 200 gallons a year. And that covers your wine, your beer, your cider, or your braggots uh, that you know, might be made. So it's all inclusive that you can, you can ferment this quantity of alcohol. Awesome. Nobody distinguishes between that. And as a home brewer, you can certainly blend your mead and your beer to get to the flavors you really want to look for and, and define that. Whereas commercially, we're usually adding the honey in after knockout uh, to, to really not to boil off the aromatics uh, from the flavor. So let's, uh, let's get into actually making a braggot. How do you uh, – do you start with barley? Do you start with honey? How do you get started? So craft yourself a beer recipe. Um, and you know, get yourself the percentages uh, that you're looking at for your base malts, and then try to substitute out you know 20, 30 percent of your base malt with the equal amount of sugar contribution from your honey, and you really have a, a decent uh, starting point for a braggot. Now, what I when I've taught at the National Honey Board's uh, beer conference, B E E R. Um, so like a bee, <laughs> but they're trying to get people to buy uh, or make braggots. And so I've taught there twice. 
what I'm talking about with them is that you know you want to adjust your mash temperature a little bit to give it a little more mouthfeel because the honey is going to really um, ferment through and dry out the beer a little bit. So if you want a little richer, fuller body that you might expect from your um, your malting, you might want to uh, adjust your mash temperature a little bit to accommodate that. So you're saying you want uh, more body then in the beer, right? Correct. So on the beer side? So you need to compensate for that drier honey um, mouthfeel that you might get. It might seem a little thinner. So if you're looking for that rich, thick uh, Russian Imperial stout body and mouthfeel, you want to just plan ahead. So, I mean, do you brew a heavier flavored beer, for example, to try and bring out more of the beer flavor? What do you, what do, you do? I mean, like that Imperial stout you, you had, I mean, it still had a lot of honey flavor to it. Yeah, so see there, I could cheat, right? So as a home brewer, I can um, I can make like I made the Russian Imperial, and I then added twenty. Let's see, it was a twenty gallon batch. I added sixty pounds of honey to a twenty gallon batch. Okay, so that's a lot of fermentables. I think it was well over uh, it was a one point one six zero. I think starting gravity, so huge. Um, so it really didn't ferment anywhere close to being dry. Um, you know, probably 20, 20 bricks. So, so I mean, you, you, you basically overwhelmed the yeast with honey. So there was residual honey left, right? Oh, truckloads. Yeah. Um, and, but, but then I blended it with an orange blossom base mead afterwards. So I could really dial in the sweetness and the, um, perception that I was looking for. So again, you, your home brewers can really kind of redefine the whole beverage industry by being able to create these beverages nobody's even done before. So like if you were to try to make a, a lactic style um, beer with honey and still have some residual sweetness to balance it, you'd almost be crazy to attempt to make that um, as, as all in one beverage together. But after the fact, if you had a really nice sour beer and you had a really beautiful, let's say, you know, traditional mead, you can counter blend those after the after the fermentation and you get a really unique beverage that you know really can't be made that way here in the United States. Now, so, I mean, so I mean is that your recommendation then? Do you think the best way to maybe make a braggot would be to blend it afterwards? Start with a you know, start with a meat, start with a with a good beer? Oh, that's a great question. If I had my choice, I would prefer to do it that way. Um, given no choice, I've worked uh, with uh, the brewers I've done collaborations with, and we've pretty much unanimously come to the same conclusion that adding the honey at the whirlpool stage of the fermentation – sorry, not fermentation – at the brewing process is the best way to go. So you get – you don't boil off the aromatics. You keep the honey as minimally processed as possible, so you get that that flavor and that aromatic. Uh, you do get a bit of a scrubbing – uh, during the fermentation process, but you know, in general, it's um, it's it's you know, it works great. So, I mean, in that case, uh, you're starting with a base beer that you brew, right? And then you carry it through to the whirlpool process, and then I guess in the whirlpool, you mix in uh, about twenty percent honey sugars. Is that right? Yeah. Or so twenty percent by weight. So by well, so let's say you were going to add, you know. I don't do a lot of small brewing recipes anymore, but that's okay. Let's, let's say you, you can gonna, do it. You can do it. You can just uh, do it with gravity if you want. Uh, most people, yeah, so, I mean, Brie is Play-Doh. So the people, you, people hear them talking about Brie, they're talking about Play-Doh. So if, if you were going to start with um, a base beer starting at 1.100, right? So 100 degree, 100 points, 80 of those points would be from your base malt. 20 points would come from your, your honey. So if you started a beer at 10.80, right? 10.080. Yep, 1080, sure. That's a nice heavy that beer. Big, strong beer, right? Russian. Oh, imperial, yeah, yeah. Imperial stout, something like that. But then you bump it up in the fermenter because at home you could always add the honey post whirlpool right into the fermenter. The challenge most breweries have on trying to add honey right into the fermenter is how do we get it into the thing, right? So, you know, it's often easier to climb up on a brewing deck pour the honey into the um, mixing tank or into the whirlpool than it is to try to figure out how do you. Um, make this happen in a, you know, in a sanitary loop. And a lot of the brewers I've worked with, and the majority of them, if all inclusive of every single one of them, want that honey sanitized before it gets into their um, into their fermenter. So they want it in the knockout so that there is no wild yeast uh, associated with it. Makes sense. Yeah. So they're so you're heating it up at that point. Yeah, um, and and the, 
the reasons for that and what why that makes sense is that you know most of the meads that I make are 14 percent or so and a little bit higher which means they're pretty strong so the chance of getting a wild uh, yeast in any kind of micro bio, um, biological activity from what you don't want is pretty minimal now cider on the other hand if you're going to make a cider and you've got six and a half percent well, that thing can go wild eight ways to Sunday before you cross your eyes. I mean, you really have to really be clean and sanitized to make sure you've got your decent pitching rates and, and nothing comes in contact with it. I'm not saying that being a mead brewer maker is less demanding of sanitation, but there's just more chances if you're making something lower in alcohol to go wrong. So a lot of the beers that I've made commercially um, in collaborations have been you know, 10% and lighter so you're really trying to be a little more um, conscientious of where your microbes can come from. So you want to sanitize that honey before it get, actually gets into the fermenter. Makes sense. Um, so walk us through. Uh, so we, we kind of walk through one option, which is to add it, uh, you know, just as you dump into the fermenter or at the whirlpool, if, I guess, if you're brewing commercially. Um, walk us through the other option now. So you make your beer. Make it to the, the best you can. Make your best mead. Um, and then take a glass and blend, you know, work out uh, contributions or ratios to find what you like and then blend to that level. So, you know, similar to, you know, how Gordon um, has talked about, Gordon Strong has talked about uh, making great meads and blending them to get to your perfect sweetness level. You know, same kind of concept works for, you know, how you make mead. Um and beer or a braggot. So if you have like the, the one that I've served at the National Homebrewers Conference the last, I think it's been five years. Um, I, it's been a long time. Um, I tasted it, tasted the beer, see where it was. Now, even though I made it to the first style that we talked about by adding the honey into the, into the fermenter, I also blended it after the fact because I set that, you know, at the National Homebrewers Conference, Vinny from Russian River gave away uh, these oak chips that he had made uh, one of his beers in. So they were very um, bug-laden, you know, lacto and bretomyces, I believe. And I made a um, Belgian Golden Strong on top of those chips, and it came out more like a Flanders Red. And um, from that yeast cake, I made the Russian Imperial on top of that. So I was intentionally trying to make something very sour from the get-go. And it took forever. I mean, like I said, this this beer I made a long time ago. I don't even, you know, long before I started my company, which is at least six and a half years ago. So probably close to eight, nine years ago. And um, so it got finished, you know, still rather tangy. But then I could use that tang, you know, the acidity level to balance the sweetness coming in from a traditional mead. But I could have also done it with a fruit mead or any other style. So you can re you really got a chef's palate or um, choice at this point. So as you think about flavors and think about how sweet and tart work together or, you know, malt and honey, you can really kind of take um, – take everything you, you're thinking of. And, and once you, um, you can, you can use like a Parsons square to, to figure out if you want to change the alcohol level, um, or sweetness level, or if you want to, uh, change, you know, I tend to do a lot by just tasting until I get the ratios I like, and then I scale it up. But I've also, you know, made use of that, um, square to say, okay, we missed the gravity here <laughs> and we need it to be here. How do we blend to get to that level? Not often, so I can't. Don't ask me any technical questions about that because I'd have to go pull up my notes. So you just uh, basically just just mixing the taste, right? I mean, take a small glass, right, and mix it up, right. So, um, can you walk us through brewing uh, something like the braggot you served at NHC? I know it was a you said it was a pretty complicated recipe, but you did you did you just brew the imperial stout first, or did you add the honey in? So I made the Russian imperial stout. Um, as I recall, um, once the fermentation was started, I then added uh, 60 pounds of honey to a 20-gallon batch. Now, the mistake I made in, and in did doing you do this, that? Did you do that early in the fermentation or later? I'm sorry. It was probably several days into it. Now, this was a colossal mistake. So I would not recommend doing this because I made a hell of a mess. Um, when you add raw honey into a fermenter, 
that is actively fermenting, it is going to um, foam over. So all the all the space comes up, uh, you know, as the CO2 is degassing. Um, it's probably not the cleanest way to uh, to try to make such a beer. Now, if I was to do it all over again with what I know now from what I've learned from all the mistakes and stuff I've learned over the years, I would add it at the whirlpool section. So once you've knocked off the heat, uh, add your honey into your brew kettle and you know get it all fully dissolved and you know measure your gravity, make sure you're happy with it. Because you know again, as a home brewer, I have complete you know I used to brew so much beer it was crazy. I mean we had barrels sitting around. You know I still have beer, mead and cider from you know up to 18 years sitting in my basement at this point. So it's I, I bet of that's a, pretty good, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, some we have a lot much. of fun. Yeah, some gets a little cardboardy or uh, oxidized over time. But uh, the bigger the, the beers are, the, they've aged quite nicely. And my homebrew club that I'm a member of here in New Hampshire um, is pretty still active. And I haven't been to as many meetings as I like, but, you know, it's always nice to dig out something that I've made with uh, my club members from years ago. Okay, so let's say we go with the option where we add it at the whirlpool, or maybe uh, just as we're starting, just before we start the fermentation. Um, how do you handle the yeast nutrients, uh, and and how do you handle the fermentation in general? Do you treat it more like a beer? Do you treat it more like a mead? Um, uh, are you adding nutrients all the way along? Ah, both options work. Uh, I've worked with uh, breweries that have treated it just like a beer without any nutrient additions. Um, my preferred way to go about it is to use um, the yeast that I use in my meadery, so Lavalin 71B, uh, and to use the nutrient regime that comes with that. Now, you got cha- yeah, commercially, you got a lot more challenges, but as a home brewer, I would definitely advise to follow the yeast uh, staggered nutrient regime that is really popular, <coughs> but, um, well well documented for having great effect. Yeah, and that's like the four yeast nutrients. I think we've covered it in some of the podcasts I did with you before, right? Right. And cust- your fans have called me a few times saying I'm pretty confusing on the data I've given there. But follow the Scott Labs uh, recommendations and uh, just divide it by four and it works perfect. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about it over the show. One of the problems, I guess, is is things have evolved over the years, right? You've added, you know, adding a, just a slightly different mix than you were a few years ago. Right. We switched to organic, uh, so Fermade O instead of Fermade K. Um, are those the same thing or are they different? Uh, well, prices are really different. Fermade O is like twice the cost, I think. Um, it, it's So it's the difference is inorganic nitrogen versus organic nitrogen. And, you know, what I'm trying, I've got some organic honey that we've imported from Zambia. So I'm really trying to, to, to go towards a... Um, I guess organic certification on some of my meads, and I can't do that if I'm using Fermade K, which is kosher. Well, that's what the K stands for, um, but it's not organic. I see. I see. Um, so you uh, you get the yeast nutrients going. How long does it take to actually ferment out a braggot? Uh, about two weeks you should be finished. Um, I do have uh, some commercial collaborations I've done that have been six months or more. Um, the one I did with uh, Cavalier in um, Australia, we used 100% of the base as honey and only used malt as adjuncts. So that one's taken a bit longer. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm really interested to try that. Oh, I skipped over step two, oxygen. Are you, um, for oxygen, obviously you're going to oxygenate it before you pitch. Do you add more oxygen after the fact or not? Or is that, nah, that would actually with- hurt the beer? Yeah, not with making a beer or a braggot. Um, only that first day. You, so you you have to. I mean, making braggots, you're trying to balance the 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 best of both worlds. So if you're making a, a mead, you really beat the daylights into it, add oxygen for the first three days, because nothing there is going to oxidize. When you're making a braggot, you've got the inverse. You've got um, the malt that will oxidize quite nastily. That's a new word. Uh, nasty. <laughs> um, so it's a, um, you really want to uh, only do it before you pitch and then stay away from that. And uh, so you ferment this out. You said it could be done in as little as a couple of weeks if you use the uh, the nutrients, right? And then uh, do you add uh, sorbates or sulfites at that point to, to stop the fermentation or are you allowed it to continue? Well, 
<laughs> so again, separating the two worlds I live in. So the home brewing side, you could do that. Um, I've never done it as a home brewer. As a commercial um, brewer, you cannot add sorbates or sulfites to a beer. It's against the law in the United States. Um, so I tend to say don't bother trying to do that. Don't try to keep it too too sweet. Um, if you are going to um, – I'm trying to think in my head real time how to might how you might want to do that if you want to keep a sweet bracket and not have bottle bombs. Um, bah, time. Yeah. Make sure your yeast yeah, I mean, you is could, done you fermenting. Could, you certainly could add the sorbites and sulfites, right? Or you could even back sweeten it, right? Potentially. Sure. Just got. I mean, as a home bracket brewer. I'd always keg everything so I could, you know, degas the kegs if I needed to. Um, I would be very cautious about putting it into a bottle if there's residual sweetness, if you haven't done that to stabilize it. Right. So if you don't add the sorbates and sulfates, you run, you run the risk of the fermentation continuing and, of course, potentially making a bottle bomb, right? Yeah. So be very, very careful. I mean, things may look done fermenting. Like I've made... You know, meads, for example, at home, two or three years later, I'm thinking, okay, it's done. I'm going to bottle this up. I put it into a bottle, and lo and behold, that a little bit of extra oxygen that gets added causes re-fermentation to take place again, and corks have pushed out a bottle. So if you cap a bottle with a crown cap, and it's got no way to release that pressure, it's going to explode. So, uh, yeah, be careful when working with honey. It can ferment for a very long time, right? Quite so. Yeah. Um, speaking of that, so you, you say it could ferment down to where you want it to be in a couple of weeks, but how long do you actually age it? You, you mentioned you aged yours for, for years in some cases. It depends on the style. Um, so if you're going to do like a uh, Berliner Weiss um, that's really light, you know, 3 or 4% alcohol, you're not going to age that for any period of time at all. And then uh, I wanted to ask you about back sweetening. I know it, it's only optional, obviously, but um, can you? A lot of a lot of brewers, especially especially beer brewers, are really not familiar with the the idea or the concept of back sweetening. So I was wondering if you could walk us through that. Yeah, so you'd want to make a tea out of your um, out of some if you want to use honey to do that. Uh, but essentially, you can measure honey or sugar uh, to back sweeten, or even fruit if you wanted to, uh, to make your. Um, uh, more perception of sweetness and body into your finished beer or braggot. Uh, I tend to not do that. Um, I really, you know, if I am going to um, back sweeten anything, I'm usually using a fermented product that's already, you know, done and stabilized. Um, mostly because I don't like the taste of raw honey in a fermented after uh, fermented beverage. So it's, it's completely different flavor profile and gives a little different aromatic uh, note to it. And it's most of the judges I've judged with in the um, last 20 years or so, if they taste or detect raw honey, they tend to use that as a fault. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, if you're back sweetening, of course, you do have to kill off the yeast first. You got to uh, somehow halt its uh, it, it from growing back, right? Otherwise, you're just going to add that, and it's just going to ferment again, right? Correct. Unless you've gotten to the point where the alcohol level is so high that that's the inhibitor to uh, any further fermentation. But you're looking at 14 and a half, 15 percent alcohol to make that happen, right? And that, that's your approach to getting sweetness in the in the beer, right? <laughs> Basically, yes. Your approach is is to to bombard it with honey to the point where it won't ferment anymore, right? That's that's the plan. But sometimes plans don't always work, right? So we do uh, we do have a sterile filtration system here at the at the shop that we can get things down. But even even with that. You know, it, when you buy a, uh, a filter cartridge, you learn pretty quickly when it says non-absolute and absolute filtration. So non-absolute means the average is is good no, is not good enough for fermentation. So if you think you've got a filter cartridge that is not an absolute filter for 0.2 micron, it's useless because it takes only one yeast to uh, make that happen, and um, they grow rather quickly. Yeah, so uh, filtration's an option. Why don't we talk about filtration for a minute, though? Um, have you got any tips for uh, for filt filtering at the homebrew level? Obviously, a little bit harder, but uh, some people can do it. Well, before I jump into filtration, I talk about racking. So, you know, you yeah. can rack your um, beer into first, secondary, tertiary. Uh, so you've gotten the... Um, 
um, sediment out from underneath it so you have a really clean bracket to start with before you might carbonate it. Uh, and most of your homebrewers, I think, are probably going to be either artificially carbonating, so force carbonating the uh, the braggot, or um, adding the dosed amount of uh, uh, sweetness to get the right carbonation level in the product. The filtration as a home brewer, I've done it um, where I've had filter sheets. Uh, I think most of the big homebrew shops um, carry those. So basically, I'd run the the braggot pre-carbonated, so not carbonated, uh, through the filter before uh, getting it into a keg. I've only had to do that uh, a few instances, but mostly trying to sh- you know save some time on on clarity. But basically, if you've brewed a good beer, it should drop pretty clear anyway. Uh, the protein levels there work really well to make that happen. Now, to clear it, do you cold crash it? Do you uh, bring it down to a lower temperature, or do you just age it at room temperature? <laughs> I got all sorts of toys. <laughs> so sure. um, I've got my temperature controlled conical that I can uh, cold crash, and I've done that. Um, I've got a non temperature controlled conical that I've used to, you know, draw the sediment out the bottom of the conical. Um, but I've also made braggots in carboys where you know we've racked it, you know, or let it sit for long periods of time. I mean, the beer that I brought to, or the braggot that I brought to the National Homebrewers Conference, I. You know, still have the the carboy, you know, that I, you know, brewed it in, way back when. So you know, mid early 2000, 2010. I don't know when the year it was, but before 2010. So early, you know, 10, 15, 12 years ago, whatever it was. But you know, still sitting on the lees inside that um, carboy. But again, I made that one to be sour. So you know, the longer the better in that case. Typically, I would recommend you know taking it off the lees. Uh, to get it as clean as possible once fermentation's done, um, and use that, you know, time. Be careful, don't splash it around because you don't want to oxidize it um, to get it nice and clean. And then transfer it to a keg, I guess. Uh, is it okay to age it in a keg? Yeah, I've got. I can still have kegs <laughs> aging down in the basement. Kegs are great because uh, you got no um, no light struck issues going to happen. Uh, if there is an issue with some refermentation, you can always degas the keg uh, without risk of injury. And um, yeah, cool. Um, next thing I want to ask you about was spices. I think spices were were commonly used in many braggots. Um, what kind of spices do you think would work best in a braggot? Uh, vanilla probably uh, so I could see a vanilla stout um, working really well also barrels if you're going to age a braggot um, they really work good in bourbon barrels um, might work with tequila or rum barrel too um, but other spices I guess the sky's the limit if you can think of the flavors like the one that Jonathan Wakefield and I put together had uh, lychee fruits um, I think it was le- or le- lychee honey Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I think possibly lychee honey and a fruit, but uh, yeah, I've done a few collaborations. Uh, so fruit works well. Um, we kettle soured that beer, so you know it had a nice uh, tang to it. And um, yeah, yeah, I guess it's a completely wide open uh, category of thinking of what you can do. There's plenty of competitions for your home brewers to consider entering. Um, whether it's the Mazer Cup out in um, Denver, Colorado, or Mead for Your Die here in New Hampshire. That's uh, one of the competitions I run. Um, and there's several other mead competitions. I don't know if – yeah, I guess beer competitions would work too. You just have to enter it into uh, the right category. Usually if you enter a mead competition, though, you got a little more mead-centric judges that uh, might be a little more familiar with the style. Yeah. Um, let's see. So we went through spices. Do you have any other tips for somebody looking to make uh brag? Oh, actually, I want to ask you one more fruit. What about fruit? Do you have any uh, preferred fruits that you use in braggots? It's wide open. It really is wide open. Um, you know, any, any kind of fruit's going to add some, uh, different type of texture and feel and flavor. Uh, I do like some blackberries in with the, um, stouts I've had in the past, you know, certainly the, the, Berliner Weiss styles, you know, really can support some light fruits. Uh, Belgian wits, you know, all it's any anything's game. I mean, I, 
I'm not going to tell you I'm going to make a watermelon mead anytime soon or a watermelon braggot. Um, it's just not a fruit I care for. And the same is true with pumpkin spices. So you're not going to see me using nutmeg anytime soon uh, in a braggot. Um, I do like ginger. I do like vanilla. For fruits, black currants, I love them. Uh, apples always seem to work good, so you can u- really get a, a unique apple honey uh, malt type of combination going through. Um, so it's it's really a wide open, you know, there are no limits. And that's the key thing to remember when you're making a braggot at home is you're defining your own style more or less. You know, if you can represent the base style beer, that's what a lot of the judges are looking for. But I've seen just as many braggots come through competitions where no base style beer is even defined because they've they've used some malt. So you don't even have to create a base style beer. You could just do malt of any kind you want without with or without hops and honey. And as long as you can taste the honey, get honey characteristics – and you get malt characteristics, well, then the world's your oyster here. So you can, you can, you know, ideally I like to have a frame of reference when I'm judging. So if you tell me, okay, this is a, you know, uh, English brown ale, I'm looking for those, those characteristics to come through as well as the honey accent, but I'm not looking for anything that's kind of focused on one. When you start doing fruit and beer or malt braggots, you're really cracking into territory nobody's ever really done commercially before. Have you played so, uh, have you played much with berries? Uh, you know, blackberries, raspberries, I know come out real strong in beer. I haven't done many braggots that way yet. Um, certainly certainly per- completely open. Yeah, the the braggots we're going to be coming out with are probably going to be a little more mainstream style-wise. You know, um, so I assume that's uh, some of the darker beer styles, right? Probably. Yeah, darker beers, IPAs. So, uh, you know, a how, Bach. I, I'm gonna ask you that one. IPA. How does how does the hops uh, uh, play with the honey flavors? It works great. You know, so we we worked um, we use some Citra hops uh, with Heretic, I think, and um, you know, you get little um, really nice nuances coming off the honey and the hops. I've used some honey malt in with uh, some of the the braggots we've made, where you're getting again, you know, that that characteristic coming off the malt and the honey. It, it's just, you know, the the key is the biggest trick is to remember that you've got to kind of modify your body and your perception of what you want the finished beer to taste like. So you have to modify your mash uh, regime to make that happen. Awesome. Um, well, Michael, do you have any final tips for somebody looking to uh, make a great braggot? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, there's completely open category. So if you, you know, I mean, if you look at the crazy beers coming out, like the biscotti, donuts, mango stuff, <laughs> you know, it, everything seems possible. Um, think through the flavors first in your mind to make sure they're going to match to what you're trying to make. And then as you're tasting it after you've brewed it, you can kind of see if you've you've hit your mark. Um, Look for uh, look for my braggots coming out soon to uh, to see if you like them or not. You know that's the other option is to try some braggots first to see what you might or might not like and what you might want to try to emulate. I I, I think you'll like them. That's my opinion. <laughs> A lot of people tend to like what I make, so <laughs> I don't know how I've gotten so blessed, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> Well, I want to give you a minute here at the end to talk about some of the things going on. Would like me to you mentioned the cider and uh, obviously the braggots coming out. Uh, but any, anything else you want to mention in a year and a minute or two? Yeah, we've got a, a brand new mead coming out that I did with uh, Scott Shar. Uh, it's called a Common Disaster, and a, it's a pineapple chipotle mead um, that we made. Uh, so he's a home brewer. Um, that uh, won a recipe or entered a recipe into a competition that I judged, and I just found it amazing so we've uh we've worked to make that and uh that'll be our probably our first new release in uh in quite some time coming out uh early next year awesome and when are the meads inside i'm sorry when are the ciders and braggots coming so ciders in the market the ciders you got out yeah. yeah so you can find uh them little apples and how do you like them apples and you know just do you want to see about my uh my sense of humor have your listeners or uh, viewers take a look at the bottom of uh, how do you like them apples and uh, have them tag the post on the bottom. Because I, you can, as a business owner, you can pretty much do anything you want with date coding. So I, I had a, a real good time with a date code on the, the first batch of how do you like them apples. So, Okay. 
I'll leave that Easter egg for people to go find. Sounds great. Um, well, Michael, thank you again for, uh, for being on the show. Really appreciate you being here. Oh, Brad, my pleasure. Look forward to it. And uh, if you ever want to do a cider talk, we can always do something there too. That'd be great. And uh, uh, of course, I'm, I'm uh, getting ready to make some mead next week. I'm very excited about it. Uh, thanks again, Michael. Uh, again, today, my guest was uh, Michael Fairbrother. He is the CEO of Moonlight Meadery. And you can find out all, all about his meads at moonlightmeadery.com. Thanks again, Mike. Cheers, my friend. Take care. Well, a big thank you to Michael Fairbrother. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get a one-year subscription now for only $19.99 from beerandbrewing.com. And also the world-class line of brewing equipment from Blickman Engineering. John Blickman has his first ever holiday giveaway where you can win a complete BrewEasy brewing system, Quick Carb Instant Carburetor, Hellfire Burner, or BrewVision Controller. You can enter for free by clicking now on the banner at BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers, lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.